I do apologize for this late stage in the evening uh, laying a very, very heavy slide on you, but there is a lot that needs to be done. But you can break it down into a couple of areas. Basically, development is one. ODMs have a teams of people sitting there cooking up cool hardware, cool form factors, trying to make them slimmer, lighter, better battery life, etc. Uh, they also do this with a lot of consideration for manufacturing, whether it's physically able to produce the technology today, and what operating system it's going to run on. And more and more, that's becoming a, a, a very, very distant third. The same hardware can run Android, Windows Mobile, potentially Symbian. Um, and that's where their real expertise lies. So the ODMs, some have their own manufacturing, some go out to contract. Uh, that's their real core business. And what they really need is an OEM to put third-party software on there, make sure it has a, a, a decent browser, pay that you know, few dollars to Opera to get their, get their software on board, and to make sure the device does work with the end user's, uh, um, end user's services. Also, the OEM performs a very, very important role in getting the device approved. You know, with smartphones and PDAs, they have to be approved for use on mobile phone companies' networks, and they've spent a lot of money building these very, very complex networks, and they want to make sure that, oh, just like the iPhone, it doesn't start crashing the network and degrading customer quality. Um, so that's what the OEMs tend to do. They tend to go around and sit down with operators and make sure the phone works on each individual network. And unfortunately, this has to be done for every different network because every network is different. Service integration is also a very important thing. Now operators are becoming far more uh, concerned with holding on to their customers, and they do that with content, they do that with services, and a lot of the operators have their own app stores, they have their own database and pool of content, and they're really looking, when they're taking a device, to have somebody integrated a bit more personally with their networks. And that's something that most ODMs don't really have the resources to do. Once you launch a phone, you have to support it as well. And now we're starting to see much closer integration with operators, because they are usually the first person you call when your phone doesn't work. You also need to make sure that uh, the operators are trained to, to deal with all this, and you need an aftermarket service center to repair cracked screens, scratches, what software upgrades, etc. So once you've done all that, you can actually start shipping product. And this is where the normal ODM ODM model really works. You have contract manufacturers who are used to providing parts, you know, 16 to 18 week lead times, turning them into devices that churn out the factory at a reasonable work rate. You have the ODM or maybe the OEM making sure that the quality of those devices coming off the production line are suitable. Then you need to get them out into the market. And again, this is a role which really uh, needs to be done by an OEM. Uh, the factories can start churning out devices, and most contract manufacturers I know don't really have any warehouses. When they build them, they put them onto the back of trucks and they ship them. So if you don't have any uh, accurate forecasting, it actually presents a problem for a lot of the Taiwanese and Chinese manufacturers. Inventory and warehouse generally needs to be done by a distributor. Even if you're selling to an operator, there'll be a master distributor for each country. They will take the goods in, hold them, and then distribute them around to the various stores, either the operator stores or the retail channel. And that's, uh, that's physically how the goods get from Taiwan to where they need to be. And the operator, of course, generally sells the stuff. And this is where we start to see the first departure. In the US, they have a very strong history of buying mobile phones directly from the operator, from Verizon, from all the, all the carriers there. And now, we see them subsidizing the handsets. Um, before, they'd subsidize cheap phones, feature phones, etc. Get you on a one-year contract, two-year contract, because their phones were costing 50 to 80 bucks to sell. Now, when you're looking at smartphones and PDAs, you're in the several hundred dollar mark even for a Nexus One or an iPhone, the actual cost to produce is quite high. But what the operators do is they subsidize it. They lock you in for a couple of years and give you the handset away for 50 bucks, 100 bucks, or maybe for free. And that's a real challenge to, to, to the way that OEMs do business because now people are expecting to go out and get an iPhone on contract without paying cash up front. And that's a fairly hefty piece of kit. They're now expecting that Blackberries and Windows Mobile devices and Symbian devices are free, as it were. The payment also kind of stretches a bit deeper. That's affecting the distribution channel a little bit. It affects the OEM. And the OEM has to spend money promoting their brand. As I said in the beginning, it's our name on the product. It's the name that you see. We want to build that recognition. Because the mobile marketplace is, is quite um, you know, competitive. There are a lot of different phones out there. A lot of different Android phones. A lot of different Windows mobile phones. And a lot of different feature phones. And you need a good brand, a strong brand, to be able to differentiate yourself. It's usually the OEM who actually pays for the device. If you're going to select a contract manufacturer, they need to do some things up front. They need to design the device, they need to you know, create the tools for the device, buy the plastics, etc. And again, that's what the OEM usually finds. So in a nutshell, hopefully very quickly, 
They're the kind of things you need to do to get the device to market. And it naturally falls into one of the different categories. And most of the ODMs in Taiwan uh, do their own design. A few have their own manufacturing, or use a contract manufacturer like Foxconn to actually just do the, do the design, and the, do the build. As I mentioned, what I really want to talk about is what happens when you don't have the OEM there. And there are a couple of companies that have been doing very, very well at that. Um, as I mentioned, my main expertise is Windows Mobile uh, phones, and HTC <coughs> made a lot of Windows Mobile phones. And for eight years, we were selling effectively the same hardware into the same market, but differentiating it with the software and the services that we provide. Um, we had uh, the iMac phone selling in Europe with the QTech brand, and I could get a device approved with an operator in three weeks, and they would come back in three months saying, well, we've got the same device from QTech, we still haven't approved it, what are you guys doing differently? So there, the OEM, the differentiator there for us was that we had the technical staff to actually go into operators and approve the devices to make sure the device was customized to each individual network. And that's something that HCC learned pretty quickly. Then in Asia Pacific, we were competing with Dopod, which was a far more successful brand. They kind of realized they needed to treat operators as their main customer rather than the end user. And they went around, they did a, little, a lot of deals with operators in entire East Asia. But then they kind of missed some of the service integration aspects and some of the aftermarket service aspects. And again, Dopod wasn't around for terribly much, terribly much longer. But HTC learns the lessons very, very well. And now they have um, a very, very well-respected OEM brand. And they made that decision clearly to make Windows Mobile devices known effectively as HTC devices. They wanted to have their own user interface to hide some of the nastiness of Windows Mobile. They wanted to take command of the aftermarket service. They wanted to take control of the relationship with the operators. And they've been very, very successful doing that with Windows Mobile. And then came Google. And Android offers another avenue for differentiation. It's a different lightweight operating system. It is the new big thing. Uh, which is why it was very, very surprising when Google decided to come out with their own phone. If you look at it from an OEM, an OEM owns the brand. Who owns the Google phone? Is it Google? Is it HTC? That was never really made clear. And unfortunately, it did become an issue at the launch when there was a small minor problem. Who did customers go to? Did they go to the one single web page on Google's support site? Did they go to HTC? It was a bit of a disaster. And the reason why that misunderstanding happened, that's really all it was, was that nobody took control and owned the brand. Google didn't want to own that phone from a brand perspective because they didn't want to dissuade other Android manufacturers. They really just wanted to get the Snapdragon platform out there as a demonstration for how good Android could be. But again, from an OEM's perspective, that, that mistake was fairly obvious. You also have operators having a far more powerful role, uh, not only subsidizing the handsets, but branding them themselves. T-Mobile was also one of the original OEMs for Windows Mobile way back eight years ago when we started. And they invested very heavily in their device team to really own the device. And they had a very, very strong brand for the device. They had very strong technical support for the device. And they had a team doing service integration as well. So they did it very, very well. But now you see other operators, especially in the US, Verizon with their Droid series of devices and Vodafone globally, coming out uh, with their own handsets. And they've done the OEM role themselves. They've gone direct to the ODMs, the contract manufacturers, and said, hey, we want this Android phone. We want it with these features. And that's fine. They've kind of learned these lessons. But now if you look at it from the ODM's point of view, you have all these different operators coming, wanting to do due diligence. Every week there's a new operator coming and doing due diligence on your factory. There are 10 people sitting doing QA at the end of your production lines. It's something that the ODMs are not really used to doing. They're not used to having that. They're used to having one OEM customer managing the QA, managing the delivery. And they're finding it a little bit of a challenge as well. And as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, the ODMs really don't have any warehousing on their, on their manufacturing floors. Uh, so when they produce the goods, they have to ship them. But if you're going direct to the operator, you're missing out the OEM. You're missing out the distributor. There's nowhere for those devices to go. And that's, again, another area that has to be managed very, very carefully. 